Hey guys, I'm the nice one, and today we're talking about texturing and UV mapping. So sit back, relax, and let me make the mistakes for you. So in my last video, you saw me go through the process of how I go about modeling a character from a basic concept art. This time, I thought it'd be really important to show you how I would approach texturing and my process in terms of how I create the UV maps, AO maps, and everything like that. So picking up where we kind of left off, you see that I have my character model here. And what I'm doing right now is a process of marking the seams along the mesh so that when everything unwraps onto the UV, it's all unwrapped nicely. And in case you guys don't already know, a UV map is basically kind of like taking a 3D object and laying it flat on a plane. So imagine a box. And imagine if you had cut seams along the edges of the box so that when you opened it, it would lie flat. That's kind of what UV mapping is. And that's what I'm doing here. So you see that I kind of marked all the seams and cut the mesh so that it would open up flat nicely and lay out onto that UV grid. So what I'm doing there is creating something called an AO map. And basically an AO map stands for an ambient occlusion map, where basically your render will create black and white map of your character and apply shading to areas where they have overlapping faces and where shadows will likely occur based on your ambient lighting, your world lighting. So you see how I brought that ambient and that UV map onto Photoshop. I'm kind of cutting everything out so that each piece is its own individual layer in Photoshop so that I can color it separately and individually. And now what you see me doing is I'm correcting the AO map because some areas look like they created shadows where there weren't supposed to be shadows and that was likely because the mesh wasn't clean enough and that there was overlapping faces. You'll notice that the character map actually also had a shadow along its chest and at first I wasn't sure what that was but actually because I had hidden the layer showing the sword belt it still calculates it when you're creating the AO map for that mesh so keep that in mind. And now you, go, you see me go through the process of texturing each individual piece. Instead of combining them all into one mesh, I decided to kind of keep them as their own separate pieces and then combine them later because I thought it would be easier to create mesh paints for each one as opposed to having to put everything onto a single UV map and then figure out which one's which. So that's what I'm doing here. And the textures I'm painting here are super simple color overlays with some shading and highlights. But you can do some amazing work by overlapping Photoshop filters, pre-made textures, and texture painting to achieve that really nice stylized look and feel. But for this case, I decided to keep it simple. Another a tip I have for you guys is when you're creating your UV maps, try and make your meshes as simple as possible and try to, re try to remove any and all unnecessary faces because unnecessary faces will cause shading that doesn't have to be there and, it'll, and you might have to correct it later in Photoshop. So that's kind of what I was doing with the sword and the belt there. I was cutting out faces that didn't need to be there or were basically like intersecting with each other when they shouldn't be, which was unnatural. And now I'm going back in and shading the actual item, the pieces themselves, adding a little bit of highlight here and there, you know, just to give it a bit of a nice touch. Now when it comes to the face, I actually marked off which was the front, the left, the right, the neck, and the top side so that I knew where to add shading in terms of where his hair was, where his ears would be, where his eyes and face would be so that it made my life a bit easier. So once you have your textures painted and ready to go, I switched over to the cycles view and realized that I needed to apply these textures as a material in order for them to be rendered in the cycles engine properly. So that's what you see me doing here. I'm using the nodes function to create a material output pair a shader to that output depending on how I want the light to interact with the material and then applying an image texture on that shader so that my painted texture would appear on the mesh. The shader you decide to use will change how light will interact with that material. So for example, diffuse shaders create a soft light distribution and refraction, while glossy shaders will create more of a metallic feel. So when you're creating a material, pick a shader that closely resembles how that material would interact with light in the real world. As I went through it, I realized that the Cycles engine is a great engine if you want to achieve super realistic lighting effects on your render. But keep in mind, it's going to super really spike up your render time depending on how powerful your machine is and what your output settings are. Things like light bounces, sample rate, and stuff like that will definitely affect how long it takes to render each frame. And yeah, that's pretty much what I did to texture my character. Throw in a bit of a background plane, some, some three-point lighting so that you give your character a, a nice kind of feel, a lighting effect, and you're pretty much good to go. 
So next I'm probably going to go into a little bit of character rigging, maybe a little bit of animation, and even talk about how you might achieve some of that stylized textures that you guys all love in video games and animations. Anyway guys, I hope you liked the video. Let me know if you find it useful or any, any kind of tips you might have, and uh, have a nice night. I'll talk to you later.